the wonderful world of pigments. In the intro to pigment video, uh, I gave you guys a, a pretty good rundown on, on my thoughts and processes regarding pigments and the use of pigments. I find that they're the best products that we have for all the various earth effects that are out there, whether it's dust or heavy dried mud, in this case, winter in Russia in 1941. Um, but really what I wanted to start with this time versus the project is really let's take a step back and look at how to really use pigments. The first thing I like to do is really treat pigments as paint. And I think that's a big mental thing. If you can understand that as pigments as paint, as a dry paint medium, it's a lot easier to understand what they're capable of doing because realistically you're putting down layers of paint in just kind of a dry textural conversation. Um, the way I approach it, and this is the way I've approached it my entire professional you know, modeling uh, career, if you will, is break them into batches, put them into simplistic forms, in this case, uh, inside 35 mil film containers, and the clear ones are great for this. Uh, you can find those on eBay pretty cheap still, I believe, uh, until they <laughs> disappear off of the planet forever. Um, or anything of the sort, any little container like that will work great. But they're, they're nice because they do seal airtight, etc. They're perfect for travel and all that. But what I like to do is do a light, medium, and dark batch. Mix up a light batch first, five or six colors. The list of the colors I use are in the description down below. And this is just kind of a brief walkthrough of that. And you see it in all the books. I talk about this all the time for many, many years. I find it to be a hyper-efficient, very intuitive, uh, and superb way to kind of play with pigments and get them set up in an easy to use manner uh, and then having them all kind of pre-made this way. And the reason I'm using all these colors is very, very simple actually, is when they are applied and dried, fixed and all that good stuff that we do with pigments, the fact that there's five or six colors in that batch creates far more depth than a single color application would. It's as simple as that. They can't compete one to one. So. You either have to layer them all up, or if you do it this way, where I go in these batches of light, medium, dark, you now have across three containers like that, about 15 total colors that are being employed, which gives the model so much more life and depth of close. When you see these in, photo in the photographs in the books, this is the reason the pigments shine with RSP products that you guys are reading about, is because I'm going through this process and I've done all the hard work for you, really. I mean, I've, I went through the learning of it, how to use them, best way to apply it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, to teach you guys, these are phenomenal products to really, really up your, you know, earth effect game, really. And by, by doing a really simple process, uh, light to dark, and again, you guys have heard me talk about this for, for quite a while now. When it comes to weathering, light to dark is a very fundamental process to lean upon. It's not a hard rule, but it's a great learning tool and educational kind of conversation to really build up your skill set, to develop your weathering out. Because a lot of guys, doesn't matter the subject. This is a tank, of course, and in the winter stug, and it's it's one of my favorites. But the truth of the matter is, weathering is complicated for a lot of guys. That they just you can't really put your brain around it sometimes because it requires so much effort to achieve in terms of. You look at it and go, wow, that's a fantastically worn out, dirty machine. And how do I get that? Well, light to dark is a foundation principle that really eases your brain into that conversation of the mental aspect of how to do this. Light to dark, put down a layer of light pigments. On top of that, put down a layer of medium pigments that cover about half of what you just laid down. And then about half of that, you put down some dark pigments. And the the idea of the colors in this conversation is really about moisture. Dried mud, the darker the color, the wetter the earth, typically. But also you get a variety of kind of age across the vehicle that dirt used in the field or, you know, gained in the field by especially tanks driving around all the time, etc. You know, it's not one day. And I've you've heard again, this is just a repeat of a lot of what I've said to date, is it doesn't happen in a day. You know, these tanks have been in the field for weeks, if not months. In some cases, in certain countries, in certain vehicles, more than that, you know, months to years kind of conversation. So the mud and the dirt will add up over time. And that's part of what you're trying to do here in a very efficient manner. You can see how quick right there, that's about 15 minutes of work to get to that stage. And that's, you can't take away that kind of power. Like if you think about what pigments are capable of and what we can really, really do with them, that's a, that's a phenomenally efficient process right there to get something that dirty and muddy 
that quick and easy. And really from there, it's just practice. So don't be scared about this. You know, pull out your models, get the stuff down, work it in. Definitely use a hairdryer. Got to use a hairdryer because otherwise you'd be waiting days and days for this stuff to dry. But fundamentally, to work with pigments and then to come in the backside of that and to throw down some oils into this, it's a one-two punch that cannot be equaled in the hobby. And I hate to say that, you know, there's a lot of products out there in the thin enamel conversation, a lot of guys that use them really well, but you still can't come up to this level of texture and usability, efficiency, non-toxic, no odors, all that fun stuff with this pigment slash OPR weathering process. So it's kind of one of those things I really want to hammer home for, for many of you. If you've never really used pigments to any extent and have always kind of been hesitant about them, you know, between the intro to pigment video that I've already done, between all the books that you have, uh, and most of the, all the tank books have pigment use in them. Uh, and then I believe the SMO2 does as well. But I think really what it is, is about coming in here and understanding your, your replication of dust through mud is one of the most powerful weathering tools and visual storytelling aspects that we're going to have at our disposal. It is critical. If you're going to win a gold medal in this conversation, if you think you're going to walk into a weathered model competition, and you're not dealing with earth effects properly, or you think this is you know, gonna be done with oils and enamels only, you're gonna get beat by other guys that understand the power of pigments. So keep that in mind, take it to heart. Uh, and even if you're not a big competition model, it's not always about that, but it is you know, the, the barometer by which we judge a lot of this stuff. So pigments come in, they provide us with this dry earth texture. We can come back on top with the oil paints and you can watch me walk all the way through this and read the captions at your leisure where I discuss basically a two-stage process, getting the light to dark down in the pigments. And then I somewhat repeat that with the oils as well. But it is a flexible system. Like I said a few minutes ago, it's not a hard rule. So you can come back in with dark stains on top of that. You can come back in with light stains, come back with dust, come back with the winter stuff, however you're trying to play this out. Uh, but then we can get into the snow once we've got all that kind of worked out. It's not that it's not a challenging conversation in terms of matching colors with the oils and the pigments. You know, just your visual acuity will usually go uh, well enough with that process. But the snow is a product uh, blend that I've I've come to really like over time. It may not be the best of the best, but I find it actually works really, really well, especially in 35th scale as that is white pigments combined with woodland scenic snow and about a 60 40 mix of the pigments to the snow. And again, because there's pigments in it, you can fix it to the model the same exact way. So they work together harmoniously. You know, there's no ill effects. And again, and if you're unfamiliar, when you reapply a fixer to the pigments, that's just a liquid color that is wet. And then when it dries, it returns to the color it was before it got wet with the fixer. So you see me kind of coming and going with the fixtures on this. It doesn't harm the color or harm the model to add more later on, which is why they're so capable of being layered up together like this. So if you think about that and you walk that all the way through again, uh, you realize, you know, there's four or five, six layers already within a really short amount of time, very efficiently applied. You're in maximum control and your results are world class. That's a pretty stout conversation right there. So think about that when you're trying to really set forward your weathered, you know, ground effects on your machine and what you're trying to really achieve with that. Second to that is in, even though I can't show it here, I'm not showing it here in particular, is just don't sleep on your references. You know, have your photos out there, the World War II stuff, even the modern stuff, you combine the two together so you can kind of see colors and dirt and earth tones. And, you know, this is, this is an Eastern European piece, but you can do stuff in the desert or, you know, wherever you're at, uh, North America, et cetera. So, I mean, snow is snow, right? So it's no big deal in that part. But in terms of the earth effects, uh, you can change up however you want to do that. Um, but I will touch on the fixers real quick uh, while, I've, while I start the mapping uh, with the oils here and let you kind of watch me walk through of adding extra white, uh, winter whitewash stuff to the wheels. When it comes to pigment fixers in particular, and I've mentioned this in the other videos and I talk about it a little bit in the books, is I tend to lean on the paint thinners of the brand of paint I've painted my model with as kind of my fixer. And that's usually a good enough bind. And second to that, and almost more importantly, to be honest with you, about equal weight is the paint thinners allow the pigments to dry dead matte as actual dirt would dry dead matte. And that's a big deal because part of the problem with the with the enamel fixers is they often contain a varnish in them. Often that varnish is a gloss. 
because of its adhering has kind of a, a stickiness, like a glue quality to it, which gives it its strength. Well, that gloss will fight you because you will see it. And that's kind of one of the problems I have with, with, with the product fixers that are called fixers that they have a lot of that kind of chemical in it. Plus they're enamels and they do stink. And they, I just find it a lot easier to work with the, with the, the acrylic thinners, to be honest with you. Uh, and that's, that's also from 15, 20 years of doing this, by the way, this isn't anything new. Uh, I've been doing it this way from the start and it works, su su you know, supremely well to gold medal level standard at the best European shows. So understand that and take that to heart. That's from years and years of use and development and the acrylic thinners dry rapidly, but they dry effectively. Whereas an enamel thinner will dry almost too fast and have no bond that we really need it, especially if you're an acrylic painter, which is 90% of us out there in the military world. It's, an, it's either an acrylic lacquer or it's a, it's a true acrylic. So there's very few enamel paint jobs left, by the way. That said, let's get under the tracks, which is my favorite part. <laughs> and as you all know, I love my rules. Uh, metal tracks to me, uh, they're one of the reasons I became an armor modeler, to be honest with you. It, it, they just bring so much realism to the, to the table and conversation. With the blackening right there that you see the tracks are, are ready to go same process which is beautiful super easy nothing to stress about toss the pigments down just you just the only thing you really have to be careful with is just don't sneeze or breathe or laugh around these because you'll blow them all around when they're dry like this so work slowly carefully and then come in with the with the, your fixer and lay them down in there one of the things i want to mention real quick is in this convert this question came up recently uh is eyedropper versus syringe to apply the fixer with the reason I lean on the eyedropper, and this is also for all the videos out there, if you just a little, little segue sidebar, the, the captions on screen are the text, the how, the voiceover that you hear me talking about, the reason I do it this way, is this is the why, what's in my head, what am I thinking about? And that's how I find that combination of teaching you guys to be superior to everybody else. It really, I really do put forward the maximum effort to lay down some captions that have value, then voice over this to kind of explain everything to you. And in the eyedropper syringe conversation, the reason I don't use a syringe is because you often can easily over flood the surface. If you think about that hand movement with the syringe, if you screw that up or it goes down too much, it's, it's hard to control. Whereas an eyedropper, you can really lay in just like one single drop exactly where you want it. And I like that part of it. I think it's a superior. It's also easier and cheaper, et cetera. There's no, there's no, I guess, cost evaluation of a syringe versus an eyedropper. Nobody cares. But in my opinion, I think just in terms of use, usability, eyedroppers are, are the way to go with that. Plus, you get a little bit more randomness out of it when you need to, and I do appreciate that. But nothing beats the randomness of speckling, and you guys should know, it's my fave. Uh, always speckle, always hair dry, just kind of part of weathering now. I just think it should just be kind of in our conversation, just be part of vernacular. You know, when you're ordering coffee, you know, at Starbucks, and you know, can you can you speckle some, some sprinkles on top for me? You know, they may not know what you're talking about, but the fellow behind you in line who, who weathers his models too, they'll know, they'll know. But the inside of the tracks are done the same way. There's really not a lot different. And tip, the only difference is there's a little bit less pigments being employed. Obviously the cleaner side of the track, you can see I'm building up my outer winter cut and it's kind of a little bit muddier on, the, on those extensions. And then the inner track run itself is a little bit uh, dustier, drier, less, less depth to pigments. But another beautiful way to, to get a fixer down, again, many of you have seen this before, is to take out your airbrush, crank that PSI down to like two or three PSI and just let it spit the fixer out. In this case, it's just a paint thinner, doesn't matter. Gets that down and you can see the drops hitting. And it's those tiny little speckled drops of fixer out of the airbrush and or you can speckle it down too, same way. I kind of overlap a lot of this. You know, there is no one and done. You know, layering is layering and that's, that's the core, the foundation pillar of everything is layering. So take that also into consideration when you're doing this. And then for the reason of the metal tracks, sand it back down and you can bring out that bright metal. Um, I wouldn't say the only reason for metal tracks, but this is a primary reason. And so I come in with the, the that was an Infini sanding sponge. They make a couple different products. This is that little softer, kind of just general sanding sponge that they have. Um, probably a you know, fine grit, 400, 600, will do just fine. Uh, and all I'm doing is just kind of knocking the material off the guide teeth and the contact patches. And then on the outer side, just kind of rubbing the cleats out so that they show kind of a bright work. And then I will say too, uh, compositionally, I alter this across many of my projects. But you can see here that, um, I mean, 
it's I'm speechless. I mean, I love this. I mean, there's really just nothing better than that, in my opinion, in terms of armor modeling. It's it's the best of the best of the best, sir. I love it. Um, snow. Back to the snow. Same idea. I find that applying it in clumps. Again, I, I you know this comes from studying a lot of references. And I'm talking references of tanks in the tundra, not so much maybe in the deep snow, say Norway or Sweden, but more in the Russian tundra, that hard packed snow. They kind of get in the tracks, but they don't cover it up. And that's, to me, for, for a lot of you, and take this one to heart as well, composition matters. It really, really does. And what I'm trying to do here is really compose kind of the white starkness against the rest of the earth tones and the neutral tones that you see across the model. So I don't want powerful snow white effects all over my tracks. I want them in some kind of some spots. So that's what you kind of see me doing here is, is laying this out. Some parts have a little bit more intensity. And, and again, if you're unfamiliar and know how to do that, then just go and pop open some, you know, some images of this kind of stuff to kind of settle your brain and say, okay, ah, that's what he's talking about. That's what that looks like. All right, cool. Okay. And that's how I come about and develop that. You know, it's just, it's straightforward like that. I'm not trying to reinvent the wheel. And you can see how as it kind of blends in with the pigments, some get dirtier, and it's exactly what happens in the real life. And then you've got the bright work from the polished tracks. Again, what I meant to say was not every tank will have that. If a tank has been sitting for a couple of days, those cleats will rust back over or could. So you have a variety of options and choices to make when it comes to your finishes on your tracks. And then the stressful part. <laughs> As if the rest wasn't. Actually, the rest, the, the first part is easy. This is the part I probably hate the most. Uh, it's stressful for all of us, you know, mounting a metal track to a tank. Um, most most tank tracks, in particular, German, uh, are handed left and right, directional. So make sure that that's on correctly, especially the Panzer 3 4 series. That's very, very specific. Uh, winter can go a specific way. And as you can see here, they're going to look phenomenal once they're on the model. But delicately feed that through the fender return roller gap get that down on there um, take your time <laughs> it's not the most fun process uh, I put a big sponge underneath so that the models cushioned and there's paper towels so nothing gets scuffed and all that kind of stuff uh, and what you really want to do is have that last and final joint kind of kind of hidden under one of the bottom of the road wheels and then from there I'm going to take some tweezers and my pliers and my brass rod I'm going to kind of hold it together carefully um, determine which one you know, okay remember, okay it was that one there we go okay now I got to go in and feed in this brass rod 20 thou brass rod by the way for fools works great for the 35th scale tracks leave it a little bit longer so you can trim it off later if you have to remove the tracks for transport or whatever it is but there you go I mean that is one side one and done there will be a lot more to follow so stay tuned and thank you guys for all your support <laughs>